You're I'm good. Ready? You're, yes. I'm going to let everyone in the meeting. Yep. And I'm going to disable okay. that waiting room. And you will not have to worry about that anymore. All right. Thank you. All right. It is March 25th, 2021. Welcome to the planning board. Those of you that would like to participate, it has to be done by remote access only. And you can find that on the planning board's website. So that said, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. No move. Is there a second. second? Second. All in favor? Ms. Barbine. Aye. Ms. Lampert. Aye. Mr. McLean. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Thank you, unanimous, all in favor. And just a side note, Rebecca Lewis will be joining us later this evening. So she will probably miss the first two items on the agenda this evening. So Bob McLean will be voting. Okay. All right, Bob, can you just unmute yourself? Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't want you to hear my daughter crying in the background. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. It's bedtime, so. You got to say, oh, bed. Yeah. Oh, all right. So um, item number one is a public hearing special permit accessory dwelling for 129 Stockbridge Road. Assessor's map block lot 54-1-41. Applicant owner Kyle and Eunice Sak Sakari. Okay. And so this is um, the public notice. In accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 9 and 11, with, the, with situate zoning bylaw section 530, accessory dwelling special permit, and section 940 referrals, the planning board will conduct a public hearing at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, March 25th, 2021, in the select board's hearing room at the Situate Town Hall, 600 Chief Justice Christian Highway. The subject of the hearing is an application submitted by applicant owner Kyle and Eunice Zakarki for an accessory dwelling special permit within a newly constructed detached structure at property located at 129 Stockbridge Road situate. Property is as shown on assessor's map block parcel 54-1-41. Plans are available for review in the planning board office, town hall situate by appointment only. Participation in the public hearing for abutters and other interested parties will be by remote access only. Please call the planning board office at 781-545-8730 for additional information. Okay, so who is making the presentation, please, on 129 Stockbridge Road? Uh, Tracy Sharkey, Guaranteed Builders, 14 West Street, Douglas, Massachusetts. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, we are proposing the accessory dwelling of 1,045 square feet on the property. And um, there is a question about the gross square footage, but we intend to meet the requirements of the board with the 40% of the existing dwelling. I'm here to answer any questions. Um, we did get it feedback from the water department and we will meet their uh, requirements for connection. Okay, you also received the feedback from the sewer department as well? Yes. Now, how did you uh, come up with your 40%? What are you using as your gross square footage, please? In addition to the assessor's card, there is uh, square footage in the basement, a laundry room, and a gym, as well as square footage above the um, existing bump out that has not been included from the assessor. We did reach out to the assessor. They said they would um, confirm those square footages after the construction. Is the basement a walkout basement? No. Is it a finished basement? It's partially finished with a gym and a laundry area. Okay. Um, and the attic, is that finished? No, it is not. It's unfinished. Okay. okay. Well, as it stands right now, we cannot 
include that, the attic and the basement as part of your 3,000 square feet. As far as we're concerned, or I am concerned, it's a 2,106 square foot dwelling. Therefore, 40% of that is about 800 square feet. So I think what... Continue, sorry. All right. Basically, what you're looking to do is to bring in, as far as I can see, and I have looked at the property, is um, basically not the size of another house on one lot. And I, for one, have some trouble with that. And so at that said, I'll turn it over to Karen for her comments and then the board. Thank you. Um, so I, I sent you pictures of what the basement, the gym area looks like and what this attic looks like. And I have talked to the assessors and the assessors has offered to go out to the home and to uh, measure to confirm the square footage. But I showed the pictures to the assessors and the assessors did not believe that that was um, floor area. And the assessors was last out there I th um, not that long ago. And, but he is, he had offered to go out. Um, I relayed that to the applicant um, or to Ms. Uh, Sharkey and I, yeah, the assessors never heard for, from her. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll open it up to the board. Bob, Ms. would you like- Ms. Chairwoman, um, could yes. I clarify? Um, the owners did reach out to the assessors and I have an email um, that they said that they would go out after the construction. Uh, that does not, no, that can't, it has to be. If you have to, it's got to be before. Before construction. All right, Bob, would you like to comment, please? Uh, I have nothing for the group on this. All right, thank you. Stephen. Well, Anne, I, I tend to agree with you. I think, I think we should use the same measure of square foot that we've used for all other accessory dwellings. And that becomes the benchmark to the extent that um, they want to reassess it or have the assessor look at it. It's not good enough to have the assessor do it after the fact because we're not we're not going to change the size of the dwelling if the number comes in different or something. So now is the time to get it squared away and use the right square footage and then propose uh, a uh, you know an accessory dwelling that meets the the zoning bylaws. Thank you. Um, Patty? I concur. Ben? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the zoning bylaw, really, there isn't, there really shouldn't be much question. I mean, we have a definition of gross floor area in our, in our zoning bylaw, um, which clearly states that um, attics or cellars not intended for human, or not used for human occupancy are not supposed to be included in that area. So, I think that's pretty standard. And then if I'm not mistaken for, for those areas, I think there's also a technical de definition in perhaps the situ zoning bylaw, but also in the building code about what constitutes a, a habitable or usable space for human occupancy. So I think that the assessor um, or maybe the building inspector need to, to, to make a determination on that. And then, I, I mean, I, I as a board member won't really feel comfortable until that's been, I guess, technically evaluated so yeah, i think right. it's standard ben that we basically hold everybody up to so we should we should stick with that standard and, and get it get it get it right and then they'll be able you know we're not opposed to a proposal for an accessory dwelling but it just has to meet the requirements sure right yeah so, all right so is there anything else from the board at this moment okay well, um, I would just like to add that it's also the site is also in the water resource protection district. And so there needs to be some attempt to um, infiltrate the water from any proposed uh, roof to recharge it to the uh, ground because it is in the water resource protection district. Yeah, good point. All right. So, Ms. Sharkey, I have to tell you, we have two choices here. 
we can just deny this outright because it does not meet our criteria or, or we can continue this until such time as the applicants can meet with the building department, with the assessors, and then come up with a far better plan than what the, you are putting forward at this time. So there's a choice that needs to be made here. Yeah, just for clarity, uh, you mentioned under, as Benjamin said, uh, gross floor area, human occupancy is not defined in the building code. So habitable space is. Um, so that was the tricky part because you can, I mean, there's laundry area in the basement, there's a gym in the basement. I understand how they're determining that. Um, and also in 2012, uh, they, this same property received a decision that had a condition where they were adding an addition on to the home to meet the 40%. So um, I would say that the applicant will meet the 40%. Um, it's just whether or not the basement um, qualifies for human occupancy which is not a definition in the building code. Um, and it's just the way that it's written. I understand the board has some idea of what qualifies and what does not. Um, so we would be willing to meet, yes, that 40% and also um, propose some diffuser pits or um, drywalls to catch the runoff from the roof for that. So I would... Um, I would say I can continue. I would request the board to continue the hearing if they're not comfortable with making a decision conditional on the 40%, um, the 40 square footage number. The plans actually have to show what's, what the area is. It has to be reflected in the plans. And thus, it's not reflected in the plans. Thus, the board cannot condition that. They've never conditioned that on anybody. They All the plans that have to be presented ahead of time have to show it. The difference between the 2012 approval and this one is they showed an addition to meet the 40%. Okay, I'm looking at that now. Um, is there public comment, please? If you'd like to, if there's anyone in the, um participating that would like to make any public comment, you can do so by raising your hand. If you go to the bottom of your screen, if you're participating by video and click um, by participants, you will then be able to raise your hand. If you're on by telephone, you can hit star nine to raise your hand. So we'll open public um, comments at this time. You have a hand raised? I don't see anything. On, under options, there's a hand up, but I don't know who that is. I don't see anyone's hand. <clears throat> right here. Oh. No, you're not. Okay. So, ah. Ah, it's just too much. It's too much. This technology is killing me. Okay, so. Right, so how much time do you think you're going to need for a continuance? Um, to the next scheduled meeting. Uh, we're full on that meeting, I believe. I mean, I was thinking perhaps April 22nd so that you would have um, time to talk to the assessor, get the assessor out there? We did speak with the assessor and they said that they would not go out there. But if you spoke with them- I have spoken after with them. He said, told me that he would be, he would, he would go out. I mean, okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if it's available, then we will take the 22nd. It's why don't we do April 22nd at seven o'clock? Okay. All right. I move to accept the applicant's request for a continuance of the accessory dwelling public hearing 
for 129 Stockbridge Road until April 22nd, 2021 at 7 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Ms. Burbine. Aye. Ms. Lampert. Aye. Mr. McLean. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Thank you, unanimous. All in favor? Thank you. Next Thank item. you very much, board, for your time. All right, we'll see you on the 22nd then. Bye. We have a public hearing at 7 p.m. and we are almost 15 minutes early. So. Can you all go home? <laughs> no, you can't go home. Well, I'm sorry, I'm already home. We are home. <laughs> <laughs> Not right now. Okay. Let's see. Karen, what would you like to do? Well, you can do the minutes and accounting and start with uh, the, the end stuff. Okay. So Let's... I move to approve the meeting minutes for February 25, 2021. Second. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Ms. Barbine. Aye. Ms. Lambert. Aye. Mr. McLean. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Thank you. Unanimous all in favor. And I move to approve the requisition of $1,142.50 to Harriman Associates for consulting services on the master plan for $2,081.60 to Horsley Witten for the peer review services for Seaside Institute Phase 2 for $525 to Barrett Consulting Group LLC for work on the side bylaw and for $20.38 to W.B. Mason for office supplies. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Ms. Barbine. Aye. Ms. Lampert. Aye. Mr. McLean. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Thank you, unanimous. All in favor? Okay. Um, liaison reports. Does anybody have anything they need to report? Well, um, I do for the zoning. Oh, sorry, Ben. Ben, go ahead. Oh, my, mine was just that um, I think Karen sent a very well worded email uh, w with an update um, on the master plan. So we have our the latest uh, draft available and we're trying to get our final round of comments in um, with plenty of time. I think the deadlines uh, later in April, but just if everyone could review the latest draft, I think we've made Emily, our consultant, work pretty hard to uh, address all the comments and there's been some substantive changes to it so let's just uh i'll try to kind of we're, we're getting towards the home stretch so if if everyone could just review that and try to get your comments in um that would be that would be great and then we're expecting to get uh, that on the schedule with with the planning board at some point okay thank you patty so uh zoning i uh, had a very interesting uh appeal from the residents of 124 front street they are going to approach the town, but they don't know who, to talk about having stickered parking in Cole Parkway. They're gonna send a letter of the Zoning Board of Appeals to, they assume it's the town administrator and the Board of Selectmen, for everyone in the harbor uh, to allow expanded overnight parking in Cole Parkway to residents of the harbor district. Well, I never heard of that, so. Well, that's interesting because I, I find it um, somewhat difficult when you take public parking and basically make it private. So I'm not sure how they can do that. Well, uh, like I said, they were, um, th there was a lot of concern that the people who bought the houses did not have parking when they bought them. But apparently at that time, it was before the ABCD parking configuration, so they could park anywhere. Now, um, but all co Parkway floods, so people are moving. So there's a lot of angst about parking down there. So the other issue that came up as a side issue to this was if anybody ever wanted to expand the marina, there is no place to put any cars in co Parkway for overnight parking. So this will be an interesting discussion. Well, maybe one of the things they need to think about is in the summertime for the boaters, to have them drop their stuff at the, have a drop off yeah. at the town marina and then park up at Jenkins School. 
and then have a jitney to take them back. So then that frees up some space. Yep. So that they're not jamming the place. Yep. Anyway, that's a thought. But that was, uh, so they had four, four items on their agenda. They withdrew one without prejudice, but of course they approved all the other three. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, just to let you know, so. That's it for that. And conservation is busy, busy, busy. Try to yes. find wetlands on uh, Tilden Road, the big project over there. Where on Tilden Road? So you know where the farm is across from Rainbow Court? The Madeiros, the Monteros. Yes, yes. Okay. So apparently there are four houses right in a row on that long driveway. And the two in the back uh, want to take down a dwelling, but they haven't delineated the wetlands. and. Um, so they withdrew that. They're gonna go come back to that. They want Amy to go back out and look at that. It's it's pretty wet back there. I never even knew there were four houses there. But I lived there forever, right down the street. So, um, and um, it's all about wetlands hearings, and um, they're concerned about people building all of the Barrier Beach still. So that's it. We'll right now. Okay. Um, I went to traffic rules. And a gentleman, he did not give his, his name, his full name. I think he lives up on Old Oak and Bucket, uh, Walnut Tree Hill, and he's very concerned about the crosswalks at uh, the roundabout and the fact that people go plowing through there and not paying any attention. Oh, yeah. So they're trying to come up with some methodology to slow people down. The, some, um, Sean is going to talk to uh, Mass Highway, DOT, but also to when you enter the roundabout, it's supposed to be 20 miles an hour. And of course, nobody pays any attention to that. So that's an enforcement issue. And then at the um, Jacob Hatch house, there's a lot of shrubbery and brush at the corner of Countryway and Driftway that probably needs to be cut back because it impedes sight distance. So and they're going to talk about maybe more signage, et cetera, repaint the, the, side, the, um, what would you, the crosswalks, et cetera. So that's what they discussed on Tuesday night. And I noticed in the Mariner today, which I think is good news, that um, Complete Streets awarded the town of Situate $400,000 to complete the sidewalk from Huey Road down to Greenbush, which I think is really a terrific thing. Mm -hmm. yes. Excellent. So um, that's all I have to report on traffic rules. And then I received a phone call from um, a business owner down on Front Street trying to figure out how to engage businesses to take down their Christmas decorations and to do, you know, up you know, clean up the place and make it lovely. And it's really up to the, the property owners more than it is the businesses. It's so, uh, it has nothing really to do with us on the planning board. I suggested that she talk to Sue DePisa, who's a chair of economic development and our new planning and development director, Kyle Boyd. So when in doubt, you delegate. There you go. There you go. So we have five more minutes. Uh, and there was one more thing. How do we country club is putting in a new septic system? Joy or rapture. And uh, well, it, they had to continue it because DEP hasn't given it um, a number yet. So it's a Presby system. I'm not too sure what that means. Any of the engineers can tell us? Does, what a Presby? Steve, does Steve know what that is? Uh, Mr. McLean? I'm looking it up right now. I, I don't know off the top of my head. No. I learned a little bit about Presby systems um, from a meeting I was at this week. They're kind of a smaller system and they, uh, they don't take up as much room as a regular standard septic system. So could be very similar to what was done at um, Paris Estates. Oh, okay. But there's, I'm told there's Presby systems all over town. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, they, they haven't assigned a file number yet, so um, conservation is not willing to let them go ahead with the project. Okay. 
Bob, did you make it to any of the meetings that you had signed up for? Um, yeah, so the Economic Development um, Committee, uh, there have been two since we last met, and uh, <clears throat> they're discussing the um, North Situate, they either call it the Visitor Center or the Clubhouse, um, but the building next to the playground also, um, there were discussions on the future look of what um, is going to go on at Pier 44, mostly. Okay. We're talking about attending the, the planning board. So, <laughs> um, also, the Public Building Commission uh, was a lot of um, a lot of discussion about the uh, senior center. All right. Hello. <laughs> okay. Who was that? Not me. That was you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> I love Zoom. It's so fun. Okay, we've got uh, two minutes to waste between now and then. Anything else that's earth shattering? Well, I can give you a brief update and I can probably do it in two minutes. Yes. Um, Curtis Estates will be coming on our agenda for next meeting asking for a subdivision extension. 60 Country Way mixed use special permit is not going forward. Um, I'm talking with the brewery about uh, they kind of want to be outside this year and they want to have more stone gravel surface for, uh, for walkways and do outdoor seating and not have indoor seating. Um, so we're trying to work that out. Um, the Merritt property has been sold at residential compound development. So um, I talked to the attorney for the new buyer. Um, we'll see when that comes in. And we got a project eligibility um, application for Bartlett Fields. For how many units, Karen? 268. How Rental. many? 268. 268, holy cow. Rental. And how tall are these buildings, Karen? Well, they say they're four stories. Four yeah. four-story buildings. Okay. All right. So I'm working on comments um, to the town administrator. Um, and then the town administrator put, is putting together all the comments he receives from all the departments and um, then submitting them by April 22nd. And I think people, you all should know that the group that is going forward with this is Toll Brothers. It's so. Toll Brothers Apartment Division, yes. which is different from Toll Brothers Division, that residential division. But it's still Toll Brothers by any other name. Yes. And, they got, and they got a clear cut the forest from 3A to Clap Road. Right. Um, yes, yes, yep. Okay, all right, it is now seven o'clock and time for our public hearing on a uh, special permit accessory dwelling at 63 Situate Avenue. And I'll read the, um, in accordance with Mass General Laws, chapter 40A, section nine and 11, with Situate Zoning Bylaw, section 530, accessory dwelling special permit, and section 940 referrals, the planning board will conduct a public hearing at seven o'clock PM on Thursday, March 25th, 2021 in the select board's hearing room at the Situate Town Hall, 600 Chief Justice Cushing Highway. The subject of the hearing is an application submitted by applicant owner, David and Ann Mahara for an accessory dwelling special permit within an existing attached garage at property located at 63 Situate Avenue, Situate. Property as shown on the assessor's map, block parcel 40-4-9. Plans are available in the planning board office, uh, remote access only, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. All right, who is making the presentation on this, please? I will be. I'm Paula O'Connell from OCO Architecture and Design. I'm here on behalf of Amy and David Meharry, who are also here online. Um, okay. 
So most of that, you know, explained with there's an existing three car garage with an unfinished space above it. The plan is to convert that into an apartment. Um, so the according to the assessors, the house is at 3,367 square feet. Um, the second floor of the garage, once finished, will be 762 square feet. So we're at 22% of the overall. So although we're over 750, we're much below the 40% of the living area, the main, uh, main dwelling. Um, it meets all zoning. It's only the average height is about 26 foot three, lower than the 35. Um, it's 32.1 feet from the street which is over the 30 feet that we need. And on the side and rear, it's a corner lot, it just comes nowhere near there. Um, and the home is also on sewer. So we don't have a septic issue in this particular property. All right, and you have read um, the responses from the fire department, water department and sewer, that the building is to be um, hardwired for the fire department and then fees will need to be paid for sewer and for water, a new water hookup. Yep. Yes. Sure. And Mrs. Meharry, you're unmuted, so you can speak. Yes, okay. yes. Although yes. I think the water um, recommendation that we had was simply that a recommendation and not a requirement. That's correct. It's a, it's a recommendation, but it's okay. a very, it's a hard recommendation, but that it is a recommendation. Thank you. All right. I'll open it up to the board for discussion. Um, Steve? Um, no, I, you know, I think in, in, on the whole, it looks, it looks uh, fine to me. I mean, it, it feels like it fits all of the, the requirements under the uh, accessory dwelling. Um, and it looks to me like it's, you know, it, it's going to be, it's gonna fit in with the rest of the house so that it, uh, you know, it's it's not something that's going to stand out, or and it's going to feel more. It'll feel subordinate to the main house. Um, it is a just a single bedroom accessory dwelling, correct? Yes. <clears throat> okay. And um, the lighting on it is is are, is is there any outdoor lighting that's going to be on this? It's all existing. So no uh, no new lighting then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I don't have any other questions, Ann. Okay, thank you. All right, Ben. Um, I don't really have much, but I just to clarify, it looks like um, from the plants that the the majority of the uh, accessory dwelling is going to consist of uh, interior renovations, except for kind of some dormering and like a small deck and maybe an ex exterior stairwell. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so there's no there's no change to the to the footprint of the structure yeah, or anything. Not at all. Uh, okay, that, that's all I have at this time. Patty, uh, nothing here. Thank you. Okay, and Bob. Uh, no, I agree with uh, everyone's assessment that changed and the I'm, footprint. All right, and Karen. Um, I just want to I I agree with everyone's assessment. I just want to say that as part of the standard conditions. Um, we always require no on-street parking for the primary or the accessory dwelling, and the planning board reserves the right to have an inspection prior to occupancy. Of course. Okay. All right. Public comment. So if you'd like to make any public comment, you can go to the bottom of your screen and click on participants, and then be able to raise your hand. If you're participating just by phone, you can hit star nine. And we will enter public comment at this time. I don't think we have any comment. Okay. All right. This one was easy. <laughs> they, should, they should all be this easy. <laughs> really, thank you very much. Your job well done. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you, Paula. I make, um, I move to make the following findings of fact. One, on February 18, 2021, David and Amy, how do you pronounce your last name? Meharry. Meharry, thank you. Applied for special permit for an attached accessory dwelling 
on the property at 63 Situate Avenue. Two, according to the town of, town of Situate's assessor's records and the deed, the property at 63 Situate Avenue is owned by David and Amy Mahari. Three, based on a floor plan submitted by the applicant, the floor area of the proposed accessory dwelling will be approximately 762 gross square feet and 704 net square feet. The application indicates that this is 23% of the total square footage of the primary dwelling, which is 3,100 square feet, according to the applicant. The assessor's card indicates the net square foot footage of the house to be 3,367 square feet. This meets the size requirements of 530.2F of the zoning bylaw for accessory dwellings as the bylaw allows 750 square feet or 40% of the total square footage of the primary dwelling, whichever is greater. The accessory dwelling is subordinate to the existing single family home. For the accessory dwelling unit will be a complete separate housekeeping unit and there will only be one accessory dwelling on the lot. Five, the property is in the residential R3 zoning district the proposed attached accessory dwell, dwelling structure meets all required setbacks, building height, and yard requirements for a primary dwelling. Six, the yes, the uh, proposed accessory dwelling is proposed to be located on the second floor of an existing attached garage. Access will be via an, via an internal staircase an elevator inside the three car garage. There is a secondary access via a back door and stairway from the accessory dwelling unit. This is located at the east side of the building. Seven, the appearance of the accessory dwelling will be in keeping with the appearance of the primary dwelling. The foundation location plan, 63 Situate Avenue, Situate Mass, dated 41014, revised 102814 by Morse Engineering Company, Inc shows the location of the garage. A photograph taken in February, 2021, shows a bituminous concrete driveway for the existing dwelling and a three car garage, along with a paved backup spot slash basketball area. This appears adequate to provide two parking spaces for the primary dwelling and two spaces for the accessory dwelling. Ample parking appears to be provided. Nine, the owners have submitted a signed notarized statement that they will occupy one of the units at 63 Situate Avenue. 10, the accessory dwelling will be serviced by town water and sewer. DPW requirements for water connections and sewer connections will be met. 11, the applicant the application meets the standards of the Situate Zoning Bylaw for accessory dwelling special permit. Mm -hmm. All right, I accept a motion on the findings of fact. Second. Thank you. Thank you all in favor. Ms. Barbine. Aye. Ms. Lampert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. You're muted, Mr. Pritchard. Hello. I was trying to make sure my computer didn't make extraneous noises. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Mr. McLeod, McLean. All right. All right. I thank you unanimous all in favor. All right. I move to approve the special permit for an accessory dwelling at 63 Situate Avenue for following conditions. In addition to the standard conditions for accessory dwellings approved by the planning board after a public hearing on 12-17-15. One, except for any changes necessary to meet these conditions, any construction shall be substantially, shall substantially conform to architectural plans by OCO Architecture for 63 Situate Avenue, Mass, Residential Addition and Renovation, dated 1-13-21, with revisions through 2-5-2021, consisting of a cover sheet A-000, notes and legend, a001, overall flow plan A100, first floor garage plan A101, second floor plan A102, roof plan A103, front elevation A201, rear elevation A202, 
side elevation A203, section through new dormer A301, enlarged plans A401, enlarged kitchen plan A402, foundation location plan 63, Situate Avenue, Situate Mass, dated 41014, revised 102914, prepared by Morse Engineering Company, Inc. Two, the number of bedrooms in the accessory dwelling is limited to one in the location and size indicated on the floor plan submitted with the application. Three, no further expansion of the accessory dwelling floor area is allowed without further review by the planning board. For upon occupancy of the accessory dwelling, the applicant shall provide a notarized affidavit that he or she is living in one of the dwelling units. A yearly certification that the owner occupies one of the dwelling units must be provided by March 1 yearly. Five, all requirements of the Board of Health, Building Department, Zoning Board of Appeals, Department of Public Works, Fire Department, and other town agencies must be met prior to occupancy of the accessory dwelling. Six, the accessory dwelling shall conform to all applicable standards in the building, plumbing, electrical, mechanical, fire, and health codes and bylaws. Seven, water connection must meet all requirements of the DPW water division for the accessory dwelling. The DPW recommends a separate water service for the accessory dwelling. Eight, the sewer connection must meet all requirements of the DPW sewer division for the accessory dwelling, including an $8,000 sewer connection fee. Nine, any lighting shell, any lighting installed shall be down lighting to not shed light on abutting properties. 10, construction work shall not begin prior to 7 a.m. weekdays and 8 a.m. on Saturdays and shall cease no later than 7 p.m. or sunset, whichever is earlier. No construction shall take place on Sundays or legal, legal state or federal holidays. Construction includes idling of vehicles, delivery of materials to the site, and all other construction activities. Runoff from the proposed accessory dwelling shall not be increased from the property. 12, erosion and sedimentation control devices shall be install, installed to prevent any erosion or sedimentation from leaving the site during construction. Silt socks shall be used as necessary. Is there a second, please? Second. second. No. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Ms. Burbine. Aye. Ms. Lambert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Mr. McLeod. McLean. Oh my God. I don't know why I keep doing that. Aye. <laughs> Thank you, unanimous. All in favor. Thank you. Thank you very well, much. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Okay. Um, I think we can just continue. Uh, we have a 7.30 informal discussion, seven new driftway. And I see that, um, who's here for that? Walter Sullivan, how do you do? You're muted, Walter. Okay, there you go. That's usually not unintentional when it comes to me. <laughs> this is true. Um, okay, all right. So with me here tonight is also the applicant, Frank Pollock, who's available by telephone. The project engineers, Eric Schumacher and Brad McKenzie from McKenzie Engineering, and Villa Thibault, the architect. Um, so this, we are seeking under the BZN 21 residential units. Um, and what I thought I would have um, the team do if it meets with the pleasure of the board is have Mr. Schumacher take the board through the plans um, explaining what our what our concept is and, and how we seek to achieve development of what is a very difficult site that's currently 54% covered with impervious material and that we, we seek to significantly lessen with this development. And then the architect, um, Mr. Tebal, will address any um, questions about his design. And I thought then I could talk informally with the board about some of the zoning challenges that we see um, and some of the relief that we may need. So if that's okay with the board, I thought I would ask Mr. Schumacher to address the board. All right, fine. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Shoemaker. I'm a project engineer at McKenzie Engineering Group. Uh, do you mind if I screen share the plans? That's fine. Yeah. It says host disabled participant screen sharing at the moment. 
I think that's a cue to you, Shari. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting to it. Haven't done this in a little while, so you have to give me a moment. Um, Where's Seth when we need him? I can I can discuss the existing conditions um, while we wait. So the site is bordered by Chief Justice Cushing Highway to the west and New Driftway to the south. The first Herring Brook and developed residential and commercial properties are located directly to the north as well as the west. Um, the site is currently comprised of a develop commercial building with um, an associated parking lot that's no longer in use near the building um, or the parking area. There are currently no stormwater controls on the site and to run off sheet flows untreated into the first Herring Brook as well as directly onto the new Driftway Roadway. And we are located in the Village Center and Neighborhood District in the Greenbush Driftway Gateway District, Gateway Business Subdistrict. Um, there's a number of overlay districts um, that currently are located on the site. Um, we're located in the village business overlay district, as oh, well yeah. as. A... You're not located in the village business overlay district. That, that um, there's a mistake in the zoning map, so you're that, not that located. Has changed. Okay. You're only in the VCN. Uh, a portion of the site is also located in the floodplain and watershed protection district, the water resource protection district, the salt, salt marsh and tideland conservation district, as well as DEP zone two and FEMA flood zone AE at elevation 16. Eric, you are for your screen. You most certainly can right now. All right. Thank you. So that, um, just a quick rundown of the existing conditions. Like I mentioned, the Chief Justice Cushing Highway is located over here to the west. First Herring Brook back here to the north and uh, located right here in the New Driftway intersection. So jumping to the site design. So the proposed development will consist of a four-story residential building with uh, associated Batunas concrete parking area and other site infrastructure. We're providing 20 parking spaces, including one handicap space. Um, so down here are the land usage tables um, that basically run through the dimensional constraints of the zoning bylaw and over here is section 750.5D, which is the building step back and street enclosure table. Now this table um, runs through the different offsets from, from the front property line um, and the maximum building heights required um, for that stepped uh, requirement. So at zero feet from the right of way, the max building height is 25, 25 feet away, max building height is 35, 50 feet away, it's 45. And our proposed design is shown in this column um, for 45 and a half feet, located a uh, minimum of 25 feet from the roadway. That's at this corner. <clears throat> so our other goal with this design um, was to bring the site into compliance with the stormwater management standards. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's no stormwater controls and runoff ends up back here untreated in the first Herring Brook, as well as directly onto the right of way. So our design will incorporate um, some stormwater management standards and bring the site into compliance with regard to water quality, as well as peak rate reduction uh, of the site. And as Walter mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the existing conditions um, comprised the site of 54% impervious coverage, and this design uh, results in 39% impervious. So we're reducing the impervious coverage of that site by approximately 15%. Um, with that, I'll hand it off to Phil, uh, our team's architect, to discuss a little bit about um, how the building's going to look. And I just ask a question before you close that screen. It, it looks yes. like the building is almost on top of the brook? Uh, there, there's a, a setback
from the slope. Uh, the brook is located um, up beyond the property line. So this is the slope down <clears throat> the brook. I get it, okay, thank you. Uh, Bill, you should be a co-host and able to share your screen whenever you. Um, Bill, you should be able to share your screen whenever um, okay, Eric is uh, all set. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, see if I can. Um, are you seeing the uh, the rendering? Oh, that's uh, yep. yes. so that is uh, that's an older rendering. I, I will need to show you one that's been updated. Um, so the the building itself uh, is a four story building with a with a penthouse, uh, two penthouse units. Uh, the main building height, as Eric had said, is some. 45 and a half feet above average grade plane. Uh, the floor to floor heights between floors are approximately 10 feet. Um, and the penthouse roof is 10 feet above the, above the main roof. Uh, so I, I believe it fits within the zoning requirements there. Um, as you had seen on the site plan, the building was angled from new driftway and that was to try to accommodate uh, the step height setback requirements that are in the zoning to uh, to give it some visual interest. Um, in the front, uh, let me see if I can pull up uh, that particular the this rendering. Uh, so this is the, the the most recent rendering. You can see that the bays in the front, um, as I had said. Uh, they step back um, and create different bays and, and, and along the face to try to give it some visual interest. Um, and that's also to, uh, uh, to, to try to stay within the step setback. So uh, the first corner here that you can see my pointer on, I, I hope you can see my pointer. Yes. Uh, so that uh, falls within the height setback requirements of the step zoning requirement. Uh, th this bay here also falls within the step, uh, within the requirements. Of the, so this is a, around 25, I think 25 feet. This is 35 feet. Th this roof line up here, of course, is at the 45 feet uh, mark. And so this corner, this bay, this bay uh, do fall within an area that exceeds the requirement. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll be getting into that. Uh, so the floor areas, the parking area, which is below grade is 7,408 square feet. Uh, there are 16 parking spaces in, in the parking, uh, the, uh, the underground, uh, the underground, under building parking. The first floor is also 7,408 square feet. Uh, it will contain two, uh, four two bedroom units uh, and a lobby in public areas uh, for the main entrance. And um, let me see if I can get that on there. Get back to that. So the first here, uh, we have our lobby. We have four two bedroom units. We have uh, uh, an area for post boxes and, and, and the, the amenities that we would need for, for public service. Uh, the second floor uh, is 7,474 square feet, has four two bedroom units and one one bedroom unit. Likewise, third floor and fourth floor um, have diminishing areas because the, the, the bays that we've had are, are essentially being shrunk back to provide that architectural relief on the exterior for visual, for, uh, visual interest. Uh, but they still have four two bedroom units and one one bedroom unit. And then the penthouse uh, will have 3,704 square feet and two two bedroom units. So that gives us a total of 18 two bedroom units and three one bedroom units for a total of 21 units. Where, where's the penthouse on these drawings? Um, let me, that would be right here. So the penthouse is set back uh, a minimum of 10 feet 
on the front and sides. Uh, it does not meet that requirement in the back. Um, and I believe we are, I, th I think we're five feet off the back. So uh, there we would also seek some relief. And then you can see the parking level below, we have the elevator and 16 parking spaces. So what's the height of the penthouse? Uh, so that would be 10 feet above the main roof, which is 45 feet. So the, the penthouse would end up being 55 feet. Let me get you a more current uh, elevation. I apologize for not having them all in one area. There we go. Oh, that the exterior siding is is a hardy back, hardy plank, a clapboard siding uh, for the majority. The bays that are coming out on the sides and in the front, uh, they would be a shingle style hardy plank. So it's all cementitious, uh, clapboard and shingle style. Let's see if I can. Uh, get the rendering back for you. So that again is the, um, the rendering of, of the elevations. Uh, if there's any questions for this or um, if not, I, I will turn it back to Walter. All right, so um, as Ben alluded to in our presentation, um, there, there are some, there's a lot of zoning challenges. This is a very difficult site, as we've said from the very beginning. Um, we are required to have a density bonus uh, improvement and an outdoor amenity space as part of um, the bylaw. What we would propose to do is to make a contribution um, to the town to make improvements in the area. Um, it, it the, the space is just so tight to sort of pull all that off doesn't really work. Similarly, we have an affordable component that is required. And we've tried a lot of different ways to try to get that on the site without it working. And so we're trying to locate something in the Greenbush area where we can build um, four affordable units off site. Um, so before we file our full scale plan, we, we will have something to present to the board in that regard. We obviously have to file a conservation commission and um, we do a traffic study. Um, our team has alluded to the um, some of the zoning challenges with height and setbacks um, due to the penthouse and the configuration of the lot, which again is very challenging. But we've come a long way. We've been at this for a year trying to make this site work. Um, I think that it is an improvement from where we started, and I think it's an improvement for the town. We are reducing the impervious material. Um, from 54 to I think 39%. And currently there's no stormwater management whatsoever and we would change that. Um, so it, it, it's something that's come a long way. It's a challenge, but we're very pleased at where we are now. And, and we think we've made some progress and we would welcome any comments from the board. Um, and it is our hope to um, go from this informal submission to submit formally for the board and also to get before conservation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Karen? So I guess I would recommend going down the list of um, waivers and yes. discussing um, each, each section and what the board feels about each one. Okay. So so I, who has the waivers? That through? You wanna go, you wanna read them, Walter? Yeah, I have it in front of me. So 540.4 C is the density bonus improvement. I thought it made sense to take that along with the outdoor amenity space, which I know that's a little bit out of order because that's 752.1. Um, I think in the past, the board has allowed for payment to the town in, in, in lieu thereof. And we would, we would look to do the same thing and try to reach an accord with the town. Um, I guess it would be the benefit, Karen, of 
presumably the Greenbush area. Um, this is a very challenging site. And to make it all work, I don't think we have enough room um, to do that on this site. So that was the reason for those two um, you know, requests for zoning relief. Yeah, I ask a question about sort of uh, just the outdoor space. Is there any work contemplated on you know, the exterior that is improving the sidewalks and the lighting and sort of changing the look and feel around there? So we definitely looked at that, Mr. Pritchard, and, and we're open to suggestions and, and to work with the town in that regard. Um, you know, we're, we, we, we recognize that it's, it's a fast area and, um, you know, there, there's, uh, there's things that we could do to improve it. Um, and so we, we've looked at it, but we're certainly open to suggestions, I guess is the quick answer. Yeah. Okay. Are, are you at all worried, just talking about the fast uh, area, are you at all worried that, you know, once we, if we had 21, you know, different families occupying these spaces that at some point in time, we're going to face just a, uh, a wave of noise complaints about the rotary and the traffic. I don't know. I don't know if we've considered um, no noise to be an issue. I, I, from our from our standpoint, I mean, obviously, it once was a a commercial, heavily used commercial medical building. Um, you know, obviously, the traffic pattern would be different. We're going to have to do a traffic study, Mr. Bridger, but you know, we'll mitigate whatever we have to do. But I think the site will accommodate that. I mean, I think that's our position. Okay, I, I was I was really speaking to the point that you're converting it to residential use and it's sitting right on probably one of the noisiest traffic locations in situate. Walter, if, if I could, uh, I mean, as far as construction goes, we can certainly uh, do some sound uh, attenuation within the walls and uh, get upgrade the windows for sound attenuation. So uh, inside, it would remain fairly quiet. You plan for these buildings to be owner occupied or rented? Right now, we're proposing this to be a rental. Okay. Okay, I didn't mean to get us derailed on the list of waivers. Oh, no problem. <laughs> hey, that's not hard to do with me. So, um, the next one I have. Oh, I, I don't, don't think we're really done with this one outdoor amenity space and density bonus improvement. Um, I'm not really sure that the board should be waiving outdoor amenity space. I, I think there can be some creative um, thinking with the with the with the open space types, outdoor amenity space types listed in section 752.2. You didn't waive it on the multifamily you approved. You didn't waive it on the gas station. I think there can be some creativity because. They have a whole big area in front of the building that is going to be a green lawn space. I'm just not sure that that's something that should be waived. Uh, I mean, and it would be probably worthwhile to know what alternatives have been considered. You know, um, we can certainly illustrate that. I mean, we, we did actually originally try to um, put some playground area out in front and everything. But um, again, we're we're trying to improve drainage and, you know, you know, it's now covered in pavement by over half. And we're trying to drastically reduce that, improve that situation. But I mean, we can relook at that um, and, and maybe we could do something smaller than is required um, to, to Karen's point. Um, and, and I mean, it, it's it's a very, very difficult site. And it, every time we try to put something in, Mr. Pritchard, it triggers another um, setback or, or something with, with the Rivers Act, one of those issues. So we, we can certainly look at it again, but it's a challenge. All right, Karen, are you all set with this? I'm I'm sorry, I just want to come in for a minute. I just want everyone to know that Rebecca Lewis has joined the meeting. Hi, Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca. Okay. Everybody. If the board is okay with it, I mean, if the board is, 
if the board is okay with it, then, you know. I'm not me. sure. I am yeah, not sure. Not, that, at this point. Um, not at this point. And, you know, the whole idea of putting um, affordable units off site is, is an issue. And since these are all rentals, there's no way that the one bedrooms couldn't be affordable rental units. Well, we, we certainly have looked at that um, and, and we haven't found a specific site off site. So if we don't, we're going to be coming back with that. I mean, um, Spurbon, we'll check it again, but it, it's 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 very difficult. Um, and that's when we, you know, we started thinking about off site. That's something that we did over in um, Mr. Salamato's project in Hummerock. And so I was mindful of, of trying to trying to do it that way rather than squeezing units in. Mm -hmm. um, but but just like with the open space, we can demonstrate what we try to do and accomplish and then and sort of give the board options. I'm not ready to wait anything this evening. Um, and there's an issue with the height. That's a huge building is our gateway to town. It's five stories. Yeah, so yeah I don't think the height meets the zoning bylaw. No, it doesn't. No. Um, it's such a huge thing as right as the first thing as you see is a little disconcerting. Is that yes. a, just if we're jumping onto height, is that a waiver request or uh, I'm trying to understand where where the sort of where it doesn't meet the bylaw? Yeah, and I'm going to ask um, Eric to sort of jump in here at some point, but we we believe it's a waiver under the um, under the, uh, uh, the the VZN. And that's how we're we're seeking it from this board, um, and it's you know it it gets tricky with the measurements um, on the on the height issue. And Eric, I don't know if I if I can throw you in front of the bus on this one. You could address maybe and maybe share the plan and illustrate you know where we're going over. Thanks, sir. Yeah. So as you see down here in the building setback, step back and street enclosure table. Um, so distance from the right of way, uh, 25 feet from the right of way, the max building height can be 35 feet. We're proposing 45 and a half. Um, so we exceed that requirement um, for uh, both locations that, um, that were offset from, from the right of way. So 50 feet as well as 25 feet. The entire, the entire building is 45 and a half, so. Did you- that, do, that doesn't include the penthouse. Right, that doesn't include the penthouse. The, the penthouse criteria is shown here below. <clears throat> uh, the penthouse complies, um, it's 10 feet, I believe, and it's set back 10 feet from the edge of the building. If, if, so, um, just, can we go back to the 35? Did you, did you try to, um, did you, design the building to try to meet the requirements at 30, 35 feet from I think Phil can speak to that if, if we looked at alternatives for a 35 foot building. Um, well, I, I'm, say, I'm saying 35 feet at 25 foot from the right of way, right? Yes. So, so you could step it, you could continue to step it back, right? Yeah, correct, yep. <clears throat> that's based on an average grade plane as well. That's that's not just height of the building. It's based on an average grade plane, and um, we're grading up here from the wetland slope. So that that grade plane is already low. I just want to interject here that um, the maximum height of a multifamily building is forty feet or four stories, um, and the building you know, the different setbacks and stepbacks have to be considered. And that if you were to have the penthouse here, you're gonna to have to lower the primary building to get the height with the penthouse. I talked to our consultant who wrote the bylaw on this and he indicated a penthouse can occupy 50% of the roof area and must be set back one foot for every foot in height to a maximum of 10 feet. The standards are intended to hide the penthouse from being visible at the street level. The penthouse can exceed the height of the building 
type on which it is located, but is still subject to a maximum height of 45 feet in figure 6, 750.5 D. Therefore, a penthouse on top of a multifamily building can be no taller than 45 feet. So if the penthouse is 10 feet tall, the multifamily building would have to be no taller than 35 feet. And the building that is 35 feet would have to be set back 25 feet. And the penthouse would have to be set back 50 feet from the street line. Now, I just wish to point out that in the zoning bylaw before the town meeting right now, it's, it's very clear that you say height is something that you that can't be waived. Okay, so so Karen, what you're saying, I guess, is that we would have to seek a variance from the ZBA, is that what, or 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 make it conform in that regard? Well, I guess so. Okay. Walter, if, if, you, if you'd like me to share my screen, I, I have uh, outlined the area where the roof is out of compliance. Yeah, that would be helpful if you would, Phil. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we have, we're at the 25 foot setback. So this portion of the roof is within, within the, the zoning requirements. Uh, this roof is set back so as to be compliant with the 35 foot height. And so we're at 50 feet where we, we would be allowed the 45 feet height, which is the majority of the building. So the area outlined in red is the only area of the building that is out of compliance. So it's a, it's a fairly small portion, some 1200 square feet, I think. I think I heard something a little different from Karen in that the Penthouse, the maximum height of the penthouse is 45 feet. Right? So, and you're at 55. I, well, I, so I, I will leave that one to Walter. Okay. <laughs> I know I, I heard what Karen said. So, so we'll look at that um, and, and see what our options are. Yeah, I was under the impression, Mr. Sullivan, an initial sit down in terms of this project, that these were going to be condominiums. Is that true, Karen? I thought that they were. I think that's what they said initially, but maybe, yes. maybe they've changed, they've done some analysis to change their mind. Okay, which they're entitled to do. But I'm wondering if it's almost too dense. I mean, would you be better served to have fewer but better yeah, I, mean, I, I guess you know hearing feedback from the board is why we're here to see what we can make the site work how to make it work um it, it is a very challenging site every time we tweak something we trigger some other you know mm -hmm. uh, some other issue um and so you know we we've we've done this with um open we've done this with um uh, outdoor amenity space and we've done it without it we've done it and we, we can look at it again I think Frank would be amenable to trying it with condominium units but it's it's very hard to make this work without the number of units that we're showing if I may also add uh, we are restricted to the length of the building at 100 feet so this this building is shown at 100 feet okay and um, can we keep going through other yes. Any other issues? Just, I mean, I just as a kind of an overarching. This, this is, this is still just a sort of a consultation conversation, correct? Nothing's been filed yet. Is that right? Uh, correct. Correct. We, we have to go to conservation as well. Yep. So, um, I'm not sure, Karen, if that takes care of all of all the things we want to discuss about. Um, well, you still have a couple on here that we didn't discuss. Um, 750.6, the design standard front yard build to zone 10 feet, 30 feet. Um, you're saying you have it 25 feet and 50 feet. Right, and, and again, um, I don't know if we could share the screen um, 
Phil or Eric, I don't know who wants to take that so we can sort of walk through that. Yeah, I can take that. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, so this uh, northeastern <clears throat> corner is outside of the max front yard setback uh, shown by this 50 foot offset line. <clears throat> so it's my understanding that normally the entire front facade <clears throat> needs to be located within the minimum front yard setback. Um, that's this 10 foot offset line down here and the 30 foot maximum front yard setback. So. We're located 50 feet with that front corner. Does the board have any input to that? Um, I, I would I would say that it um, that one's going to be sort of that. In my view, that sort of depends. I think we need to make sure we've addressed uh, the height issues and all of that. Um, you know, it's, I would say there's, there's maybe room for some discussion on that one. Um, that's just sort of my thought here is, you know, we've got, we've got kind of an angled building here. So it, it makes it sort of makes it difficult to, uh, you know, to, to comply with this thing, particularly, I think I think it was sort of set up as sort of thinking that the buildings would sort of run parallel in in the zones, and we're not kind of there. Um, so I, uh, you know, I'd be willing to look at that, but as a let's let's get the other issues sort of uh, addressed first. That's sort of my thought on it anyway. Can I interrupt for a second too? I, I think Brad wanted to make a comment and he's texting me that he can't be unmuted at the mm -hmm. moment. Uh, hi, can you hear me, everyone? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay, uh, Karen, I'm just, I'm just kind of responding to your comment about the penthouse units. Um, <clears throat> the penthouse units uh, applying to the, the height calculation and uh, figure four, uh, I assume uh, on page 129 of the bylaw, there's a figure four and underneath it, there's a uh, number three says height limits do not apply to penthouse dwelling units. As long as they're not visible from any sidewalk on the perimeter property line and meet the design standards of 750.6. So I think um, that was the intent, I think, of the design, of Phil's design, and I understand that maybe we need to relook, uh, reconsider the um, the waiver for the because the penthouse unit is not meeting the one-to-one -one requirement, which might make it visible from a sidewalk. So, um, am I am I misinterpreting the section? I'm sorry, which section are we on? Page, um, page 129. Page one, I think I have the 2020 bylaw on page 129, figure four, right underneath figure four, uh, number three, penthouse. Yep. Well, I will go back to our consultant and double check on this, but as I said, I, you know, I talked to him once and, um, you know, I'll ask again. That's that's what I can, I'll ask it, it, again. Okay, it just seems clear to me that if we can meet the design standards of 750.6, it wouldn't apply to the 45 foot limitation. All right, I, I'll ask again. I mean, but okay. right now right. you're not meeting the design standards under 750. You're not meeting the height standard. Of 40 feet. We're not meeting the one-to-one -one height setback. We're not meeting that ratio. So that's and something not, we need to reconsider. And you're not meeting the building height of 40 feet. Well, I think it's 45 feet. At, if, as long as you meet the setback, the step, the, the step. Right, but the main height of a multifamily building is allowed to be 40 feet. And the penthouse is on top of that. You're not meeting the main height 
of the multifamily building. But is there a is there a disparity in the bylaw in that that the section that Eric referenced on the plan with the set with the steps allows a forty five foot height as long as we meet. I'm trying to pan to that section. All right, I will. Um, I will find out if there is a discrepancy. Um, at yeah, at the fifty foot setback, the building height's allowed to be forty five feet. So I think that was uh, that's a waiver that we're asking for because obviously there are parts of the building that um, are greater than are greater than thirty five feet between the twenty five and, and fifty foot setback. All right, so I'm remembering the conversation with the consultant, and I, but I will go back and check um, on this. Yes, this is a this is a table that has maximums, but yet the basic standards are in the table table one a in seven fifty point six, and that's where it says forty feet. But I'll. I'll ask if there's a discrepancy. I, I don't, don't worry, I'll ask. Okay, appreciate that. Um, and go, you know. All right, so we'll be guided by that, um, Karen. Thank you. All right. Uh, there's okay. one other one that you didn't get to yet. All right, which um, one? No Nobody. parking. Shall be in the front build to zone. Right, 750.8.D. Is that right, Karen? Yeah. 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 So no, no parking shall be in front of the build zone. And we have a portion of parking spaces within the 50 feet max of the front build to zone. We see that on the on the drawing. Eric, you want to take that? Yeah, I'll take that. Thank you. As Walter mentioned, it's it's in the max front yard build to zone, not not the min. Um, so that's within 30 feet of the right of way. It's these two spaces and a portion of the handicapped parking space. So a total of three. And what's the what's the parking requirement for this building? Karen, do you know? Walter, um, do, yeah, I, I don't have that on the top of my head. No, I didn't calculate parking um, for the requirement for this building yet. Okay. Let's get a quick question. What are you using? Where do you measure the grade um, for the building height? I, I did a preliminary grading plan um, for this site just, just to give us a rough number to go off of. Um, so that's, that's something I have back at the office, but I, I put a day or two into, into hand grading the site and coming up with a average grade plan based on the requirements in your bylaw. How much fill will you bring in or would you bring in? I, I don't have that in the top of my head. That would that would need to be a mass balance analysis that we would have to look at. How many parking spaces are underneath the building? Believe believe it's sixteen. There is sixteen. Sixteen under the building, and how many outside the building? It's twenty outside the building. This, how many bedrooms are there? Um. 30, 39. 39. Okay. Karen, do they have adequate parking? I didn't calculate parking at this point. I mean, there's other issues that, you know, that we'll are more important. Right. They're more I important. Know. We'll calculate parking. They'll have to show how they calculate. The parking compared to the square footage and everything when they come in they you know it's one one and a half spaces per two bedroom unit one space per one bedroom unit because they're in the vcn okay table two um on page 176. That, that would be a total of 30 spaces required 
And you have more that you're showing more than 30. That is correct. So you might be able to eliminate a couple that aren't in compliance. I think we were hoping that, you know, obviously he saved some for guest parking and the like, but if, if we re relook um, the amenity open space, um, yeah, that might be something we do, Mr. Pritchard. And it, have you, have you thought about stormwater management here yet and how you will do it? I, I think Eric can address that preliminarily. I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Preliminary. Um, as Walter said, preliminarily, we'll uh, probably do some catch basins, a, a storm scepter um, unit to treat the water quality and get TSS removal. And from there, I, we'll do some soil testing on site and establish groundwater. Um, but usually with a site like this that's compact, um, we'll have to do some chambers underneath the parking lot. Uh, again, that's going to depend on the groundwater levels. It does the does the site to the um, north, um, does that, is that tapered down to the brook or is that tapered from the brook down to your site? Down to the brook. The brook is the low point. Is the low point. Well, I, think there, I think there could just, in general, there could be some value if the stormwater, if there's stormwater management here is, you know, is, you know, protecting Herring Brook at this point, um, as opposed to just the, the the runoff that we have right now. But I, it, I guess that remains to be seen as to you know what improvements really can be had from stormwater management and uh, and also meet the requirements of the you know the watershed protection districts and stuff. All right, have you had any type of discussion with sewer availability and water availability? Yeah, we, we've made some preliminary inquiries. We we will seek um, letters from both indicating that this this capacity before we submit. I, I think it's important that it not be that there's a pipe big enough to flow water, but that there is actually capacity available in the town system. So I, I would I would differentiate those two things. I understood. Yeah. All right, are there any further questions? Uh, I think um, Mr. Sullivan and his, his group need to work on this. I second that. <laughs> okay, anybody else? No? Do we want any public comments? Sure. Sure. What the public has to say. And if you would like to participate from the public, you can um, go to the bottom of your screen and raise your hand under participants, or by telephone, you can hit star nine. I do not see any public comment at this time. Well, Mr. Sullivan, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, I am sure that we will be in further discussion with you. And could I interject one more thing? Yes. Um, yes. This, this is a, uh, a facility that we would at some point refer to the design review committee to. Ab so yes, absolutely. Yep. absolutely. Integrated into the game plan. Yes, goes without saying, Steve, thank you. All right. Thank you, people. Thank you for your time. Thank Have you. A good, Have a good evening. All right. Our next item is a Form A for Zero Manhill Road. Mr. Marabito, are you with us this evening? Can you hear me, Ann? I certainly can. Okay, thank you. The ANR plan that we submitted to you on behalf of the applicant, Robert Terrell, the executor of the estate, um, was, I, has three lots, um, lots four, five, and six. Lot four and six were the subject of a special permit approval 
for 250 foot lots by the zoning board of appeals back in uh, December of last year. The decision for which was recorded with the town clerk on January 20th. Um, these lots are in the R2 zone or the 20,000 square foot zone. The two outer lots, namely lot four and six are just over 40,000 square feet. And the middle lot has 23,986 square feet. Each lot would eventually contain one single family home, even though some of them are twice the land area. But a special permit lot can only have a single family home on it. So with that I'll, I'll end and answer any questions you may have. Karen? Um, you all received a copy of the plan. You received a copy of the recorded special permit from the ZBA. Um, they have access and frontage and um, the plan should be endorsed. Okay. All right, I just need to find the motion. It's here somewhere. We have more pieces of paper than we know what to do with. Any discussion from the board concerning this? Okay, um, I move to endorse as approval not required a plan of land in the town of Situate, Mass, Manhill Road by Ross Engineering Company, Inc. for applicant owner Robert Terrell, administrator of the, the estate of Patsy Jo Terrell, dated November 12, 2020, as the division of land is not a subdivision because lots four through six, as shown in the plan, have access and frontage on Manhill Road, a public way. Lots four and six have received a special permit filed with the town clerk on 1 2021 to create two lots with a minimum of 50 feet of frontage designated as lots four and six. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Ms. Barbine. Aye. Ms. Lambert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Thank you, unanimous, all in favor. Thank we you. look forward to receiving the stormwater permit. Pardon? We look forward to receiving the stormwater permit for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on this list is 533 Country Way. All right, 533 Country Way. Um, I know that you want two form A's, correct, Paul? Yes. All right, here's my issue with this. Um, you have applied for a scenic road hearing, which will be heard on the, I believe it's the 8th of April, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay the wall in front of one of these a and r plans is two to three feet high it's a retaining wall and i'm wondering paul if you're not putting the card before the horse on this one that you would be better served to withdraw this and then resubmit it after you do your scenic road hearing and show us exactly what you're going to do with that wall and how it is going to relate to the rest of the property vis-a-vis -a, -vis a common driveway. I mean, I think that that is very important before we just go forward with what may be considered, you have the frontage, but you don't have at this moment in time, the access to that frontage. Okay. And, um... Can I speak to that? Um, you certainly may. All right, thank you. There's a, a number of things that are going on with this. First of all, in order, uh, be, uh, before the house on lot one or lot two can be uh, constructed, there's six separate permits that need to be acquired from the town of Situate. This is one of them. The other five are the septic system approvals from the Board of Health, 
um, the stormwater permit, uh, the scenic road permit, the common driveway permit, which we plan to file in the next day or so. And um, I thought this was an A and R we were discussing. It is. Yes, I'm, I'm, so, so why do we want to talk about all that other stuff? It's just right because Anne's suggesting we we hold off on this part of it, in which I I would rather not do. I I want to get this application out of the way because we have the board of health approvals, and this is the second one of six. Um, we we have filed for the scenic road, which is separate from an A and R. This this. This A&R plan meets all the tests for endorsement by the planning board under the um, uh, chapter 41, <clears throat> section 81, which is the uh, subdivision control statute. What, what it requires is that you have, that these each lot has frontage on, in this case, the public way, which it does. The statute also talks about the lot having the required frontage under the bylaw and it only talks about frontage, which is 100 feet. Each lot has 100 feet of frontage plus. So based on that alone, these lots comply with the requirements for a form A under the subdivision control law. In that A, they're on a public way, they have the frontage. Um, these are not buildable lots. And there's a note on the plan to that effect. And in, in the application, we also point out as well in the note that the access to these the access is planned to be over a common driveway. The access is to, to a lot in situate is determined by the zoning bylaw. The zoning bylaw says that your access to your lot has to be over your legal frontage or a common driveway. What we, what the uh, owner's chosen to do here is to have access to the two lots over common driveway, which would go up that interior property line. The garages would be at the upper part of the lot. Again, again, we're not talking about any of that stuff right now, right? All we're talking about is this this meet the requirements of a form A. Darren, if you think it does, then I think that's all we should discuss here. All right. So I think that we 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 have to. All right, Carl, you're incorrect in one thing. Under the subdivision control law, the it doesn't say um, vital access. Right. Vital access has been litigated as part of the subdivision of the Form A. And vital access must exist before endorsing a Form A from court decisions. You have to make for access the adequacy of the way, which country way is certainly adequate. And then you have the adequacy of access from the way to the buildable portion of the area. The access is not there now, but I agree it will be there with the when a common driveway is approved. So ultimately, it's not an insurmountable thing that you can have access, but with the case law of Poulos versus Braintree, access must be present on the ground. And access right now is not present on the ground. So um, uh, can you? Can you show that um, drawing again and, and say where the access is? Because um, I'm assuming access is uh, from the frontage, right? Yes. And on this plan, it is. So okay. It is. Why isn't that, why isn't that, um, and I'm not asking you, Paul, I'm, I'm really asking Karen, um, what, what's, what doesn't meet the test here, Karen? I want to make sure I understand. On, on lot one, on lot one, there's a there's a, a there's a concrete wall in the right of way that is approximately anywhere from two to three feet high. So can you drive your car up over the concrete wall right now? I'm not sure you can. I would tend to believe you can't. But where? Lot two, can you point out where that is? is that it right there? Yes, yes, that's it right okay. there. Okay, so that, that doesn't meet the test of access then. That's correct. Okay, but lot two does have access. I mean, I, I think that Anne is right. Perhaps that we should, that the form A shouldn't be endorsed tonight, but let the board see where the common driveway is going to be. 
I mean, I asked DPW for comments because this is a complicated project and um, there is a concrete wall in the layout that's barring access at the proposed common driveway at this time. The DPW agrees to permit removal of the wall for access. However, they're concerned about safe site distance, which Mr. Mirabito will show us when he files for the common driveway. And DPW supports the removal of the wall from the layout to allow for access and pedestrian access in front. Also, too, this well, is a reason. It sort of feels like the chicken or the egg, though, right? Um, it, if, it is. It is. But also, too. What we're trying Steve, to do is subdivide the land. Right. But, Steve, the thing is, this is a retaining wall. This is holding back basically a, a, a hill. Yeah. That's what, it's, that's what it's holding back. The criteria for an A&R is frontage, size, square footage, and access. Well, okay. and so, so one access of the doesn't is, get resolved until the retaining wall goes away. That's right. So then what is there to talk about then? Well, our approval of the common driveway, Steve. I mean, under the common driveway public, public meeting, you're going to talk about all that. Um, I think that the Form A is not legit without the common driveway. And I'm not sure that the note on the plan the note, the note on the plan says lot one and lot two access to be provided by a common driveway. It doesn't say lot one and two access. Um, it's not are not it's not real unless there's a common driveway. There's no existing common driveway, so there's you no can't. existing common driveway right now. Yeah. It doesn't say lot one and lot two um, shall, are are approved are accessible. Um, only when if common driveways approved. If the note were different, I, 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 this is, I think it's an endorsable plan ultimately, but I'm not sure it's endorsable tonight. And, and that's my point. That's my point, Steve. I think that they put the cart before the horse. That it really needs to yeah, talk I, about. All I was asking is what, our, what is our criteria? If, if the criteria is that the physical restriction that we have for access right now is uh, doesn't meet the test of uh, you know adequate access, then then we're done. There's nothing to approve or um, or do at this point. And the the issue is if they come back and propose a common driveway, but they don't have the land subdivided, how does that work? Steve, you're you're right on point. I'm going to back. Let me go back to what I started out by saying. This plan does not ensure the construction of two homes. This is, this is one step in, in six steps. This plan meets all the criteria for endorsement by the board for an A&R plan. The well, I, think we, I think we just said there's one element there where it doesn't meet the criteria. Well, right? I, I, no, I don't agree with that. The subject control law talks about each lot having the requisite frontage that's required in the zoning bylaw for the town of Situ in this case for each lot. It talks about frontage only. It doesn't talk about land area, I mean lot area. It doesn't talk about access. It talks about the frontage. Well, I, 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 the I disagree. I disagree. And in the A&R in the handbook, it talks about access. The yeah. Access. But the A&R handbook also talks about A&R plans with common driveways. But we don't have a common driveway, Paul. Driveway. At this point, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? But the thing is, if you came forward with your scenic road hearing, mm -hmm. with a sketch of, or a plan of what you plan to do with that wall, how you're going to take it out, how you're going to do whatever it is that you're going to do, then through that, you will show your driveway. Then we could, I think, without too much trouble, approve your A&R. Okay. The uh, scenic road plan, just so you know, shows the opening that we're proposing for the common driveway. Uh, well, then no, why I'm, can't you do that first, Paul? So are you suggesting that we have the A&R plan endorsed April 8th at the night of the scenic road public hearing? No, I, 
So um, we're, we're just talking, to, we're, we, we've narrowed this down to adequate access, quote unquote, adequate access, right? We're saying right now that you don't have adequate access. Come back when you have adequate access. The, why don't we have adequate access? You have a two foot wall. wall in front of it. You can't but, drive over that. Let me point something out to you. Again, the subdivision control law talks about each lot having its adequate furnish. In addition, under the situate rules and regulations of the DPW, no matter where you put a driveway, whether it's common or not, we have to get a street opening permit from the DPW. We're not talking about any of that. All we're talking about is the A and R, right? And if part of the right. criteria, what I'm saying is adequate access. Then we have adequate access there. No, you don't. I think that's where the difference is here, Paul. Is we I don't we don't see a three foot retaining wall as providing you adequate access to the property. And what I would like you to do, Paul is to withdraw this a and r until you show us how you plan to access through that cement wall All right that that'll be done on april 8th that's why i'm suggesting so that you so what i suggest is we continue this to april 8th so i suggest that you can't continue an a and r that you withdraw it and don't have to pay any additional application fees Withdraw it and resubmit. And maybe we can talk about the note on the plan, but you won't have to pay any additional um, any additional fees. That would be what I would suggest for the board. How does the rest of the board feel? Patty? Uh, what does Steve have to say? What? I just I just want to ask Karen a clarifying question. So at a scenic road hearing. They, let's let's say the permit is approved, and we don't know that to be the case, but it's approved. There still won't be on the ground adequate access. That's that's it, correct. Correct. That's, that's, that's actually, correct. Um, right. So, does the A and R, in your sort of legal assessment here, does the A and R have to have physical adequate access, or is it sufficient to have approved um, you know, an approved uh, document that says access can be had. Well, if you'd like, I can clarify that with town council. I did not, I did not talk to her on this one. I have talked to her on several other ones in the past. Uh -huh. um, I can talk to her and see if we can't um, come to an agreement about a proper note on the plan, because I do think that at some point, this is an endorsable plan. I think they can get access, but it's just yeah. a timing of when. Yeah, I, I think that's the question. If Paul comes back and he gets access on the 8th and then wants the ANR approved, the question is, well, access on the 8th is a paper approval. It's not actual access, right? Well, so. the, and, uh, the 8th is only the scenic road hearing. Yeah. He hasn't even filed the application for the common driveway. Right. All right, so. He indicates he'll file in the next few days. Okay. So at least we won't be hearing the, we've, we've advertised for the scenic road. I think the tree is posted and we would at least have a plan that you could look at for the meeting on the 8th if indeed they are gonna file in the next few days. I think we should just get clarity on whether it has to be physical access or not for an ANR. Because obviously that won't happen until construction starts, right? So just to be clear, the, the board's only issue is that wall out there. You think that's that's what's stopping you from having yes. access? Okay. Yes. I know I, I hear what you're saying. Um, and I'll probably ask to withdraw it without prejudice and resubmit it, but I just want to say for the record, even with the wall there, if this was a single lot and the driveway was going to go through the wall, we'd still have to get a curb cut from the DPW and we'd still have to get a scenic road permit. You also have the comments from the DPW. They, they, they're kind of ahead of the game. I, I spoke to um, 
one of the members over there today and they want to see the whole wall taken out, period, because they they want to see the sidewalk widen. You know, they to go take it out and then come back for an A&R. Uh, right. Mean, take it out. Right, but you have a little bit of a problem, Steve, um, in terms of drainage and you have to have... Um, yeah, it just that's why I'm asking the question, Karen, is whether he, they have to have physically have it removed or whether there has to be some sort of approval because it occurs to me that if you if you file a common driveway permit, you have to have lot boundaries for those common driveways. And right now he doesn't. Right? Uh, right. I mean, I'll ask town council. Yeah. So it, I mean, it, is, it is sort of a rock and a hard place here, I think. It is. Paul, I have one quick question for you before we move on. Okay. You have sufficient area, over 40,000 square feet. You already have a driveway. Why wouldn't you put in a duplex? That, that's not my uh, decision to make. That's the property owner's decision. Okay. You know, as you all know, there's a very old house up there, which is uh, quite large. Um, I've spoken to some of the neighbors. The owner has as well, and um, they're anxious to see that go. They're, they're aware there's two homes going in there. And I think some of them are looking forward to see the change for obvious reasons, but. Um, so all right, I, thank you. I was just curious. All right, so you, you will withdraw this a and without prejudice. Yes, yes. And resubmit. We'll resubmit it for the April 8th. Um, and say um, they don't have to do, pay an additional fee. And there will be no additional fees. Thank you. Thank you. It, um, Karen, it would be good to get clarification from town council on that. So if he's gonna file it for the 8th, there's actually something we can do. I will do my best to get an answer from her. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's quite it's, a great. We have to vote on this. All right. Um, all those in favor of allowing Mr. Marabito to withdraw this form A without prejudice to resubmit um, without any further fees on the 8th of April. Please. I second the motion. All those in favor? Ms. Barbine. Aye. Ms. Lampert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you, unanimous. All in favor. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we have um, vote the planning board reports for annual town meeting. We have fair housing and affordability standards. All right, um, these have to be presented. We have to vote on these right now, but they will be presented at town meeting. Um, fair housing standards. And then they, these all have to be signed people quicker than quick, yeah. okay? Yeah, we need all signatures by Monday. Right, so, and that doesn't give you all much time because um, town hall closes at quarter of 12 tomorrow and then at uh, 4.30, quarter of five on Monday. So we really, really, really need to make an effort, all of you, to get up here and get these signed, please, please, please. All right, um, Karen, what do I need to do with these? Um, um, oh, has everybody had it? Everybody, I sent them out for everyone to read. Um, and so I guess if Ann just moves, I mean, I, I didn't hear any changes from anybody, but if, if you just read, you know, the verbiage that you want as part of the report. Read the whole paragraph. Yeah. On. All right. Um, the pl this is planning board report to town meeting, article 27, amend zoning bylaw for fair housing and affordability standards. Uh, the planning board hereby reports that in accordance with Mass General Laws, chapter 40A, a public hearing was held on this article on February 11th, 2021, and continued until February 25, 2021, when the hearing was closed. On March 25, 2021, the board voted 
unanimously to support passage of the article at the April 12th, 2021 annual town meeting. The changes to this article allow for the fair housing and affordability standards to be applied to more than five units in all districts with the requirement that land under common ownership for housing developments cannot be segmented to avoid this requirement. The town is providing a requirement for affordable housing for all developments with six or more units to increase affordable housing production in more areas of town and meet the priority local needs for affordable and diverse types of housing while trying to meet the mandated 10% affordable housing goal as found in state chapter 40B. The planning board supports this article. This article requires a two thirds vote. All right, I'll entertain a motion to approve this to go before town meeting. So moved. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Ms. Barbine. Aye. Ms. Lambert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yep. Uh, Mr. McLean, I'm not sure if you need to vote on this because I do need your signature. So. So vote. Aye. <laughs> Thank yep. you. Unanimous. All in favor. <laughs> all right. So all right. Who wants to present this at town meeting? Don't everybody raise your hand at once. What what night is town meeting? Can you clarify again? It's the 12th. It's a Monday night. I can do it. All right. Okay, Ben's going to do that. Now we have the North Situate and Housekeeping Zoning Amendments. The Planning Board hereby reports that in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 40A, a public hearing was held on this article on February 11th, 2021, and continued until February 25, 2021, when the hearing was closed. On March 25, 2021, the board voted unanimously to support passage of the article at the April 12th, 2021 annual meeting. The changes to the zoning map and zoning bylaw will allow for development in North Situate area to follow new zoning that will replace the existing village business overlay district business and commercial zones in the North Situate area. The new zoning has two sub-districts that will promote traditional development patterns and allow for mixed use, multifamily housing, quality open spaces, complete streets, and a vibrant pedestrian environment in the area. The zoning is based on the Greenbush Driftway Village Center and Neighborhood District and the North Situate Vision Plan and included a series of public meetings that the Economic Development Commission and Planning Board held to receive public input. Existing zoning districts and overlay districts for water supply and environmental protection will be maintained. The zoning also incorporates provisions from chapter 358 of the acts of 2020. Minor housekeeping changes are included so that the zoning map correlates with the zoning bylaw. The planning board supports this article and this article requires a two thirds vote. Do I have a motion? to approve this? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Ms. Barbine. Aye. Ms. Lampart. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Mr. McLean. Mr. McLean. I said aye. Oh, yeah. sorry, gotcha. Yeah. Ms. Lewis. Yep. Thank you, unanimous, all in favor. Okay, if you guys don't mind, I'll take this on at town meeting. Okay. All right, can we, before we move on to the other report, yes. um, does the board want to have the consultant present um, to do a presentation or do you want just me to ask the consultant to give um, us an abbreviated um, PowerPoint presentation um, for town meeting? We're going to have two 24 by 36 maps of the area and 10 copies of the red line in marked up version because the, obviously we couldn't put the whole thing in the warrant. What are your thoughts people? Do you want uh, the consultant? How much, how much time will we have you think? Probably I'm not, not sure we find out, we should find out some of that on Monday. Um, when we have to go to a meet, when I when Ann and I have to go to a meeting, you know we can hold off on whether or not to have the consultant, um, and we can do that on the eighth because we'll know better the time frame that we'll have. I, don't you think? I think we should do that. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. And then we have, last but not least, um, Article 26, the planning board hereby reports that in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 40A, a public hearing was held on this article on February 11th, 2021, and closed on the same date on March 25th, 2021. The board voted unanimously to support passage of the article at the April 12th, 2021 annual town meeting. The changes to the signed bylaw are a necessary legal adjustment to the bylaw to comply with current case law definitions, prohibitive signs, temporary signs, and maintenance of signs has been added in addition to clarification for regulation of signs in residential and commercial districts. The planning board supports this article. This article requires a two thirds vote. Um, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. For a second. Second. All in favor? Okay. Yes, Can I ask this question first? Yes, Patty? Uh, Ian, um, do we know if advisory has taken this up yet? Yes, they voted against it. Okay. Right. All right. That's all I want to know. They voted against it? Yes, yep. they did. Why not? Uh, oh. We don't know. I don't. Um, my understanding is they, I'm not sure they, they think maybe political signs are still part of it and they're not really unsure. They're not sure. Um, I don't think they understand that the bylaw is unconstitutional and they don't like the fact that your sign has to be 10 feet from the paved road. Um, we're, Anna and I have to go to the selectmen's meeting, which is a joint meeting with the advisory committee on Monday night, and hopefully we'll find out more, but that, that's my understanding. That's, that's why they voted against it. Okay, I said aye. Ms. Lampert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Mr. McLean. Aye. Ms. Lewis. I can't hear Rebecca. Aye. Thank you. Thank Unanimous you. all in favor. Okay. This, this one's going to be contentious, and I don't mind being contentious on the floor of town meeting. So I'll take the sign bylaw. Unless somebody else demands that they want to do it. No. No. All right. Yeah, so suggestion when you go to the child meeting, the only um, committee that is not advertised and televised is the advisory board. Mm -hmm. And we need to see what's going on there because that's where all the big decisions are made. You're right. You're absolutely right. I, mean, I don't know right, what to so, get away with that. Mm -hmm. So I also prepared talking points for all three um, bylaws. Um, did anybody have any comments on them, or are you okay with just how they're how they're written? Um, because they're meant for tools for for you guys to be able to um, present these articles. Fine. I, okay. I thought they were all good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great job. All right. Okay. We have to vote to sign street acceptance mylars. And as built for dear common, where is, here we go. Um, move that the planning board recommend to the board of selectmen and 2020 and 2021 special. Oh, so it, should, it, should, it should be 2021 annual town, 2021 town meeting. All right, 2021. Um, town meeting that the street of Deer Common Drive be laid out in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 82, Section 21 through 24, and be accepted by town meeting to become a public way in accordance with the layout plans dated September 24th, 2019, and to sign the street accept acceptance plan and as built plans. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Ms. Burbine. Aye. Ms. Lampart. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you. Unanimous all in favor. So this is something that you all need to come in and sign quickly too. Um, we need to get this to the town clerk by um, I'd say one o'clock at the latest on Monday. All right. This has to be in the town clerk's office two weeks 
prior to town meeting and two, Monday is two weeks. Okay. How, how early are you open tomorrow? Okay, I need a piece of paper. Um, I'll be here at 8.30. Do you need me to get here earlier? Uh, no, I can't, I'll be there I can't tomorrow. I can't tomorrow. It, you can text me if you need me to get here earlier, I can meet you. No, I, 8.30 is fine, as long as you I'll can be, be here at 8.30, yep. Okay. Okay. All right, now we have to vote to endorse 18 Ford Place. I move that the planning board endorse the site plan administrator review special permit in the Greenbush Village Center and Neighborhood District plans for 18 Ford Place, situate mass, prepared by Grady Consulting, LLC, dated April 29, 20. 20 with revisions through 317 21 and conditions needed for endorsement consisting of sheets one through seven, seven A and seven B for Don McGill, applicant and owner JB Situate LLC. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Ms. Lampert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you, unanimous, all in favor. Okay. You're all set, Mr. Miguel. Thank you. All right, now we have, we're a little late and I apologize. We have a discussion of the Senior Center, 333 First Parish Road. Um, I might also add that at one point, um, I have spoken with recreation and Mara Clancy was unable to be here this evening, but she said that she's working hand in hand with Linda Hayes, that all is going well and she's very, very pleased with what's happening. So we're here to talk about parking monitoring plan and first, so let's do that. And who's here to discuss that? Mr. Kirby? Yeah, yes, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm here to, to give you an update on the parking monitoring plan. I did confer with uh, the town administrator uh, uh, to find out when the anticipated fully open operational time frame would be. And, you know, as, as with anything on the pandemic, it's, it's not a set date, but he did not think it would be any um, earlier than late summer or fall of this year. Wow. So I think it's sort of a moving target um, and, and we're ready to start whenever that occurs. But um, that, that, that's the latest I got from, um, from the town administrator. All right, but are you moving the, um, the help, the people that work for the senior center in? Are they there? The senior center was occupied on, on, on the fourth by, by staff only. It was just the staff. No programs, nothing. No. Okay. No. All right. Now the contract is doing punch list, and uh, the staff is is out of Brook Street and operating out of out of the new building. Okay. And, and you so you're saying it'll be late summer before you start opening it up to the general uh, senior public, if you will. It, it, no. it's, all, it's all dependent on uh, obviously what, what the governor's guidance is, the CDC, and, and what the town decides to do for opening. Uh, Linda, you can probably add to that. I, I might just want to interject. So, and, and again, per Jim, um, in a few weeks, the senior center could be um, open, sort of soft opening so that people could come in. The doors don't need to be locked, sort of like town hall at the moment, but in terms of being able to do formal programming, we could probably do half capacity for some of the rooms, but uh, they're actually not, since it's not completed altogether yet, there are some installations still going on. We are still waiting for some furniture. That may still wait through the month of April, maybe in May and June, we could start doing some programs in a limited capacity. We'll be able to use the outdoors. We'll have some patio furniture. So. I think the building will start to be used, but in a very limited controlled fashion. Um, I'm not sure what that looks like yet, but in discussions with the health department, we do have some opportunities certainly for programming, but just not, not near fully operational. We'll be but very- Will you receive an occupancy permit? You're under a temporary occupancy permit right now. Will that be updated to 
a full blown occupancy permit. I don't if know when that will occur. We're going to we're going to get the occupancy permit as soon as as we can from Bob Vogel. Okay. I mean the, the, the full. So then it's just it's COVID dependent is what it is more than anything else. Well, but you're going to finish the site stuff before you get the full occupancy permit. Correct, and, and and the contractors back. The weather's been good. They've 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 been spreading along, getting ready to uh, to finish up the plantings around the building. Uh, they they had a delivery due, um, so they're taking advantage of the warmer weather to uh, to finish up and and fully demo. Well, then can we ask for some type of report at the end of the summer um, or? or sooner if you go to full occupancy before that so that we know when the parking monitoring will start? Absolutely. Yes, sure. Okay. All right. Um, start it before you're in full swing. But when you get there, then, you know, within a, a couple of weeks of that probably makes sense to start it because right. you want to get the full traffic impact. Right. Well, it's we'll be heavy. monitoring for six months from whenever we actually start. I know, yeah, but you don't want to start until you're fully open and right. fully operation. But, but then you're saying you're going to be partially open. It's kind of a, a double-edged sword here. Well, but but the condition said open. full operation. All right, full operation. I, yeah. I think you wanted full operation because yeah, that that'll correct. give you the exactly. all the all the uh, the traffic and all the vehicle. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, before right, we move on, before we move on, um, do you know if a sign has been placed across the street on First Parish Road yet? Um, I know um, prohibiting left turns. I have not seen that. There, there's um, a there's a sign on 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 the site. As, I know, as, but there was one supposed to be placed across the street. It was discussed. Um, it was discussed at the internal um, DRT meeting. They said they were going to do that because cars have been observed going left turn out of there. Okay, so um, what's what's the DRT meeting? It's an internal meeting here. Um, can you follow up with the DPW? Yes, I, I know Kevin Kelly made mention that that there was a discussion of doing that, but I, I did not have any kind of information as to when, but we'll follow up with that tomorrow. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, as far as, let's see, programming of events, we, this isn't going to happen right away, correct, Linda? Well, I think I think we'll start to work with the recreation department even immediately, especially as we near summer and they will be doing their programming as they did last summer as well with their youth. So knowing that that's a peak time and a busy time for them, it'll be good to get acquainted with that. But uh, as Mara indicated when you spoke to her, we've already talked about the different things we propose to do, uh, regular meetings naturally. Um, and, and we've always wanted to create some synergy between the departments anyway, and, and hope to use, and especially this year, the outdoor space and create some opportunities um, independently and together for some of the space around the buildings. Um, and obviously want to make our parking areas available, available to the other uses, evenings and weekends, and just try to support each other generally with what we have available for resources. Um, in addition to just meeting and discussing and um, sharing our planning, so to speak, uh, I've talked to Mike Mincello, the IT director, and we can create um, some shared Outlook calendars, which we use anyway to put our regular activities um, and events in so that recreation staff could see our calendar and we theirs. Um, we could also even propose a shared calendar, much like they do for the Maritime School or the Harbor Community Building which we have always sort of submitted to before. So we check to see what else might be going on, who else might be using it um, before we make any plans and any requests to use it. Um, much like Kevin Devon on the recreation staff does now, there's permitting required when you wanna use the field or the gym. So um, we can foresee that really even in our building or theirs or the grounds themselves, we could go through some sort of process like that as well. So everybody knows. Um, 
And we could also use an email distribution list, so to speak, so that when certain things are added to calendars, um, the designated group list would receive an alert or a notification by email generally that, that things have changed. And so they would be aware of, um, of those things, especially if we create kind of the combined list that might really serve us more for the off hours for the evenings and weekends, which we um, would be more likely to have to really coordinate besides the use of the building site for regular uh, daytime use at the senior center and for recreations, regular uses. Um, they do a quarterly seasonal brochure. So we'll have that and we'll sort of be part of, they'll make us aware of that as they complete it. And we do a bi-monthly newsletter. So we'll share those plans as well prior to the publication of that, of that um, item. So um, I guess discussing the combined calendar, I think the online scheduling, if we are doing any evening meetings, if the senior center is doing you know, an extended day exercise or activity or some sort of monthly activity, then that would be something that we coordinate as well um, with the recreation department, especially during their times when they have basketball or something else going on in the building regularly. Okay. Uh, thank you. About Is that it? All right. Karen, do you have anything for us? The, um, how's it working with the, with the uh, food bank people? Well, it's working great. They're not there yet. No, they're not there yet. They um, anticipate April 1. Oh, April. Right, they, April 1, yeah. Okay. But it's being prepared for them, at least outside. Okay. And that's something else that has to be thrown into the mix. That, and, um, you know, Linda and Maura have been um, considering that. Yeah. Well, it'll be picked up in, this, in the study too, right? In the parking okay. monitoring plan once it goes forward. It should be, yes. Okay. All right. Any other comments from the board? Well, can I just talk about the parking lot in general right now? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, uh, I have some concern about the, um, the water to the lights. I have uh, reason to go down First Parish Road almost every evening for the last two weeks. Um, and I looked at the plan and the lights in the middle of the parking lot are at 142 watts. I can see them all the way at Ronnie Shum's store. They seem to be excessively bright and the building's not even open. The other place where it's really bright is around the portico, which I understand when you're open, but right now there's nobody there. And the only people who are taking advantage of that right now are skateboarders who know that there's an empty parking lot with lights on. Another attractive nuisance for, uh, attractive nuisance for kids to go to. So. Mm. Uh, but, but they are very, very bright, as I had said all, all along. So can Mr. Kirby respond to that? I can. Uh, right now, the, the lights are set to, to go on, uh, both the, the uh, parking light poles and the building lights are set to go on at 6, and they go off at 9 o'clock. Uh, this past Friday, um, the designer uh, and myself and a, a lighting consultant went down to the site to do a foot candle um, measurement of the lighting in comparison to the photometrics that, that had um, been issued as part of the design. The parking lot lights are all within the, um, uh, uh, the me measurements uh, that were on the photometrics. The one area that we have that that's, um, was higher is at the main entry, the, the, front, the front door to the senior center. That, that area um, has both wall sconces, which, which you need to have a light at each uh, entry door, and it has the uh, recessed fixtures that are up in the uh, ceiling of the porch. Uh, what we are, we are looking into is uh, reducing the wattage on the, the wall sconce uh, lights, uh, at least on, that, on the west side, uh, because of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the issue with um, uh, shining into the neighbor's uh, 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 windows. Uh, we, we do have to have lighting, but it, 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 that, that area is bright. So that's something that, that we can do. Um, we're also um, uh, going to check with the uh, a police chief to make sure that how that building is uh, when everything goes off, because when the lights go off, they all go off. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure with him whether he's, um, he's okay with that and from the uh, security of the building and the site. 
aspect because we do have cameras on the building, but it, it may be tough to uh, see what's going on if, if there's no light. So we're, we're, we're looking into that a little bit also. I thought you were supposed to have a motion sensor on those lights. The, the light poles are supposed to, after nine o'clock, the light poles are supposed to be activated with a motion sensor and come on at a reduced illumination. That, that is being reviewed by the engineer and the, and the lighting designer. It's, it's not operational yet. It's not installed yet. But that was also part of the discussion as to uh, getting that uh, operational. Of course, that will, that will mean if, you know, if someone drives into the, uh, the parking lot, all the lights will go on. Mm -hmm. on, on, the, on the light poles, not on the building. It's, it's the light poles that are, are supposed to be motion. You mean uh, one motion sensor would set off all of the parking lot lights? Aren't they individually motion sensored? No, they, they, would, they would come on as a, they're, they're, they're tied in as a zone. Um, I think they're, I believe there's two zones. Is the, the zone on the west side of the property and then uh, the remaining, the center and on the east side along where the uh, the B-Wing school is. Hmm. Okay. All right. Anybody else? So I just want to know that we will hear something else about the lights at some point, whether they're going to water off and reduce wattage or whatnot. Yes. Yeah, okay. I, can, I can report back on that. No problem. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Karen, anything else? Um, no, that was what we had asked them to come in and talk to us about tonight. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. We have one hand raised. Uh, public comment. Hi. Um, yes, I did want to mention that the... Can you just please identify oh, yourself? Uh, Susanna, address, Green, please? Susanna Green, 337 First Parish Road. Um, I did want to mention, I know that Steve went out and looked at the lights. Um, the perimeter lights aren't the issue. It's the double lights in the center of the parking lot that are exceedingly bright. They're shining into everybody's homes. I mean, it's obnoxious. Nobody's come over here from the, um, the OPM to, you know, actually see what it's like. My neighbor's yard is lit up like a Christmas tree. Um, you know, they shine into the living rooms, they shine into the bedrooms. I mean, I don't care if they shut off at nine. I mean, we're sitting here and the lights are shining in. Um, you've got seniors in the back that are complaining. Um, my, my other neighbors, um, a butters to us, they can see them from their house. And same as what Patty said, I came home the other night and I could see them all the way at Shones while I was sitting at the light. I mean, they're, there's really no need for them to be that bright. Um, you've got lights shining on grass in the back. There's no parking back there. Um, you know, we're not arguing that you need parking lot lights. It's just there's no need for them to be that bright. Okay, um, Mr. Kirby, you will take that, that all under advisement. And I understand that um, Karen has forwarded you every single email that she has received concerning these lights. And hopefully you will be able to resolve the brightness of those center lights. I can report back, yeah, absolutely. Please work, work on that, please, sir, okay? Mm -hmm. We're all neighbors and we all have to get along, all right? Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, people. All right, now we're moving on to um, Zero Beaver Dam Road, wherever that is. Um, Next slide. Next. Where is it? Okay, who is Zero Beaver Dam Road? This is Greg Morse, Morse Engineering. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Again, this is Greg Morse, Morse Engineering. I'm a registered engineer um, working for the property owner. William Scanlon, Lisa Morrissey. This is a Form A application to divide assessor's parcel 45-16-23A, which is a which is a landlocked piece of land with zero frontage. It's located in the R3 zoning district. Um, 
the proposal here is to take this property, which is a little over 65,000 square feet, it's all upland, and to divide it into two parcels. Parcel one would be 31,864 square feet and would be conveyed to an abutter. Parcel two being 32,562 square feet um, would remain the property of the applicant. Neither parcel is a buildable lot, general note 10 on the plan, as well as the parcel identifiers on the plan state that um, these parcels have no frontage to them. These properties are registered with the, or sorry, recorded with the registry of deeds. And we feel that they're entitled, entitled to 81 endorsement. Um, if you look at chapter 41, 81P, it states the A&R endorsement shall not be withheld unless such a plan shows a subdivision. Section 81L specifically defines what a subdivision is. A subdivision is the division of a tract of land into two or more lots. What we're proposing here, these are not lots, these are unbuildable parcels. We've stated such on the plan and we feel that the plan is entitled to endorsement. Karen? Um. I theoretically, I agree with Mr. Morris. I'm just going to point out to the board that all the requirements in your regulations have not been met with this plan, but I ultimately think this is an endorsable plan. How does that square? Excuse me? How does that square if all the requirements haven't been met then how is it endorsable? Um, you know, it doesn't show setback lines. It doesn't show, I mean, it doesn't show the whole lot. Um, it doesn't show where you get where the frontage for the lot is on Poplar Street. I understand that this is a rare unbuildable lot. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's more on the minor side. Okay, any further comments? All right. Um, I move to endorse as approval not required a plan of land in situate mass showing a division of assessor's parcel 45-16-23A stamped by Douglas L. Alberg, PLS of Morse Engineering Company, Inc. for applicant owner William P. Scanlon and Lisa Morrissey dated January 12, 2021 as the division of the tract of land shown on the accompanying plan is not a subdivision because it shows a proposed conveyance or change in lot line, which does not alter the existing frontage as required under the situate zoning bylaw. Planning board endorsement of this plan is not a determination of conformance with zoning regulations. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Ms. Burbine. Aye. Lampert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you, unanimous, all in favor. Okay. All right, our next and final is um, Five Clap Road. And who is the individual on this one? Again, Gregory Morse, Morse Engineering. Well, this one's, I think, very straightforward. It's just sort of kind of a shame that that beautiful property is being divided. It's kind of sad, but that's the way it goes, right? Okay, would you what, tell us what you're doing? Thank you, Greg. Sure. So again, Gregory Morris, registered engineer, representing the property owners, James and Lori Hall. This property is located at Five Clap Road. Um, it's located in the R1 zoning district. The proposal here is to take the property and divide it into two lots. Um, lot one having 56,558 square feet and 344 feet of frontage containing the existing home. Lot two being 48,198 square feet with 175 feet of frontage. Both lots conform with the frontage and area requirements for zoning and the plans entitled to endorsement. Karen? 
Uh, the plan is endorsable. It may require a scenic road hearing because there's a stone wall that goes along the whole frontage of it, of the property. Some of it is in the public right of way. Some of it is on private property. So it just depends on where a future driveway is going to be. And I'm just going to comment. Again, it's very unfortunate, the, the lot shape of uh, the lot, the remaining lot one. It's very confusing what, where lot one ultimately is going to be. Potentially confusing for future property owners. It is proposed to have the lot line with concrete boundary markers staked as required in your regulations. Um, so we don't believe it'll be confusing at all where the location is. Okay. All right, any further discussion? I move to endorse as approval not required a plan of showing a division of five clap road assessors parcel 25-4-1 Situate Mass, stamped by Douglas L. Albert, PLS of Morse Engineering Company, Inc., for applicant owner James and Laurie Hall, as the division of the tract of land shown on the accompanying plan is not a subdivision because every lot shown on the plan has frontage of at least the distance presently required by the, by, required by the Situate Zoning Bylaw on the public way of Clap Road, Grove Street. Planning Board. Of endorsement of this plan is not a determination as to the conformance with zoning regulations. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Ms. Burbine. Aye. Ms. Lampert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you, unanimous, all in favor. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Karen, do you want to finish up planning and development? I think I did. I mean, I think I gave you the two minute version of that. So we're done. That's all good. Yeah. Unless you have any questions on anything I said, I mean. No. Does anybody have anything they want to add or chat about? No. All right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Ms. Barbine. Aye. Ms. Lambert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you, unanimous. All in favor? Thank you, people. We'll see you again on the 8th, if not sooner. Don't forget to come in and sign this stuff. It's so important. Please, 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 please. And Seth, at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. All right, Seth, it's always a pleasure. Always great to see you, Miss Burbank. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.